first, like, Fur and Gold is the first alternative night that you start doing on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. And I was brought in as a guest DJ. Right. So Fur and Gold starts with Sean Johnson mm -hmm. and David. Yes. And David's the only DJ at first. Yes. For, uh, for three or four months. And then I was brought in in May after it started in February, I guess. And this is what, 09 now? Uh, 2010. 2010. Okay. So you're brought on pretty early into the process. Mm-hmm. And then you and David start doing it. And it's pretty successful right out, right out of the gate. It was. Right? It was. Um, and that's at the alley. And that's the second Friday of every month. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it has not missed any dates since, right? Uh, only la oh, uh, last blizzard. year because of a blizzard. Right. Which but, it, was <laughs> it was so hard to have to cancel that. But everyone did right. when the tea stops running. Right. So, so it, it was pretty consistent right from 2010. <clears throat> you were brought on early on. Um, and uh, but how long are you there with David before David leaves? Uh, through the s summer, I think he left in the October okay. of 2010. So David leaves, and you guys sort of is your your first instinct is we have to replace him with somebody else. Is that th what happens when when he leaves? Uh, he moves to LA, right? He moved to LA, and I wanted. I guess we didn't have to, but I liked. I thought that that really was a, a cool thing that Ferengold had was the the to two DJs with the different styles because he was definitely more kind of had a rock, new wave, a more maybe more underground style than I did. And then when I came in, it was a little more pop and a little more um, electronic and maybe '90s type. So I it complimented well, and it was a good flow for the night. And so, I, I at that point I felt like that was maybe kind of a fur and gold thing. So when he was leaving, I really kind of felt like we needed to replicate that. And that's when um, my friend Bruce Durfler, DJ Taffy. He had never DJed before, but he had wonderful taste in music, and he was sort of a savant about all of right. And he's all got of a pretty music. vast library. Of it's music. a huge library. Yeah. And I kind of approached him. I mean, he's the first person I thought of, and I, you know, we really get along well. And I approached him thinking, I, uh, I can, if you can get just a, few, you know, this basic equipment, I can show you how to use it in an easy way to get you started, mm -hmm. and I think you'll really enjoy it mm -hmm. once you do it. And he, and he, uh. He might have been a little bit nervous, but I think he was excited. And certainly once he did it the first time, he he's was... always so struck me as pretty confident, though. I mean, that you know, even if he was a little nervous, mm -hmm. he, he's always struck me he as... He should be a little nervous. <laughs> he should be. But he's always struck me as fairly confident that he yes. probably would get through it just fine, though. Mm -hmm. At the same time, because what's happening with you is... A, are, you're coming along at a time in the 2000s where not only is vinyl going away and digital's coming in, but also the notion of a gay bar is changing where it's not the, the central organizing... Mm -hmm place anymore for people to go every week on the same Friday or the same Saturday or whatever. So that stability is all kind of shifting. Right. So you come along at a real turning point for Boston and probably for all the parts of the country too in, in terms of going out in a nightlife, right? Um, so, but Taffy comes along and, and, and without any DJ experience and shows that music selection is probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. That we talk a lot about, we had this talk last night actually mm -hmm. too, about technical skill, about right. mixing and all that stuff. And that stuff's important. But you can learn that. But it's <laughs> actually, you, it's kind of better to just jump in and start learning that. Right. You know, and in front of people and seeing what works and doesn't work. Right. And making a, a big mistake and seeing how people react. You know, it, it kind of helps you learn it. And this might seem obvious to other DJs who might be watching this at, mm -hmm. at some point. Um, but I think that for any who, anybody who's not... Um, I think it really, it, it, I can't stress enough the importance of like having a good collection of music and right. that song selection during the night is really key. Although when I say song, I'm talking more like real vocal, chorus, mm -hmm. verse kind of things. When you get into non-vocal things, you know, it's about, it is more about creating a mood and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but they're kind of two different kind of ways to do it. Fur and Gold, I think, has a more song-based approach. Definitely. It's all all songs. Yeah. Uh, and it, and you know, for Uncle, it's uh, it is kind of a dance night, but it doesn't have to be. And it, I've, through the years, uh, you know, you've seen it wax and wane. Where some, where even month to month, sometimes the crowd is just much more social, which I think is job well done. You know, that's right. what we want, especially in Boston. Right. Um, everyone talking and having a good time, and then other times people are do kind of erupt into dancing, right. and I just think it's a natural thing. I, I th you could play the same songs every time, and people would react differently. Right. Right. So it's that 
that's not re- the song. It doesn't matter. You know, play this song and they'll do it. it. That doesn't work. Right. And the alley is not really known as for as a dance bar anyway. No. So if it, if dancing breaks out there, great because right. it's just <laughs> it's these people are just moved to you know whatever's happening at the time. Um, so that's more of a song based thing, and, and you've been doing that with Bruce now for about three or plus years, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. With with Bruce, DJ Taffy, um, and. It, I, it seems to me that that night has only gotten bigger mm-hmm. over the past three years. I mean, you say it started out strong, and but it's it started out strong, but it was just its own crowd. Um, yeah, I feel like it's broadened but out. But now it's broadened, and you know, people know about it's kind of nationally. So like, you don't know community. a lot of people. That, sometimes there are nights when you don't really know a lot of people that are there. Whereas right. in the beginning, or a lot you of new people. You knew a lot of the people that were there mm-hmm. personally, but now you know, yeah, I used to know everybody there. Yeah, but I like that. I'm always. Uh, I mean, I like. I mean, I love having the regulars and people that we know, but for me, I think for any night, I'm always wanting new people each month. And that's, like, that's, I guess, a personal goal for me and for the night. It's right. just to always, I mean, be happy with what you have, but always be trying to reach more people and right. never just rest on the right. laurels of your regular crowd. So what inspires you to do a different night at the Milky Way? What, what's, what is the impetus for Boyfriends? Uh, that, well, they, they're... We weren't thinking about another night. The Milky Way actually approached uh, Sean and me about, I guess they had seen us in the news with Fern Gold in the paper, or right. uh, maybe Edge Boston or The Globe, right. and uh, they wanted to start a gay male night at the Milky Way. I guess the Milky Way nights are known mostly as kind of lesbian nights, right. uh, even though I, like, La Boom is a really mixed night, I, and I go there, and a lot of my friends do, but I guess they wanted a night that focused more on gay male. And, I was I really was interested in it. I love the Milky Way. But I really felt strongly that we should do something just very, very different from Fur and Gold and not make it kind of a even, you know, like a beardy guy and I. Like I mean that's obviously Sean and I are beardy guys. <laughs> yeah, and we're we're really into that crowd, but I really felt like this should be more general. It should be a general gay night taking it's like taking a gay night to JP mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't just, you know, be all, even an alternative as alternative as fur and gold. But you're, early on in the process, your, your idea is to have you as the resident DJ and then bring in guest DJs, mm-hmm. different guest DJs, pretty much every month, unless it's a month where you just think you can do the whole night yourself, mm-hmm. depending on how busy it's going to be or what month it is or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so you really want to bring in guest DJs, different guest DJs every month. And part of it was, uh, I just thought that would be fun to work with. There were a lot of DJs I wanted to play with. Oh, I know. The at Ferngo we can't really have guest DJs because there's two of us already in a very tight right. setup <clears throat> in the DJ booth, so it's hard to, you know, plug out and unplug. It's kind of impossible. Right. Uh, but also, ju- we had a, f- a few guest DJs, but the way it breaks up the night, it, it's almost not worth your time because right. you end up playing for like 45 minutes mm-hmm. or, or more when you have three DJs even in a night like it until 2 a.m. night. Actually, so I wanted, I, that was my opportunity to have guest DJs friendly. When does this idea of having more than one DJ on the bill really take hold? I don't know when it took hold, like, in the DJ community in general. I mean, I know that, like, um, it, it, in festivals and things like that, that's kind of been where where that happens a lot. Right. But when did it start happening in, like, club environments where you, instead of just having one DJ, you had to have at least two, sometimes three? I almost feel like it's because it started in the indie night, uh, community. Right. And I think it was a necessity. I mean, I think it was natural because to have a night like this, which it's your night and you're completely responsible for promoting it and running it, it's one person can't really do that uh, feasibly. So I think it would generally be a few people who were kind of into the same sound that would get together and do it as a necessity. Right. It's like a group effort. And it helped increase attendance if you could both pool your resources. Pool and pool your all of your contacts and to getting people and Fern Gold certainly uh, 2010 it started with Facebook I mean that was its first introduction yeah uh, and at the when it first started we you know we would have everything on Facebook the photos the um, playlists yeah. we would put those on Facebook so it was kind of a one stop place so the notion of advertising print advertising or any of that stuff which was very common in gay bars and mm-hmm. all that stuff that's kind of our, that's pretty much gone away and you need a budget for that and you need a and budget. We, didn't, we don't right. have a budget. <laughs> right. Although now, the thing that's changed about social media is that, we, and you and I have both done this and we've both experimented with it, is that um, paying for ads on Facebook actually has become 
um, a reasonable alternative. Mm -hmm. It's not that expensive to it's do not it. That expensive. Um, but Facebook has kind of maneuvered everybody into this spot <laughs> now where they really don't, if they want people to see their event, right. you kind of have to play ball with them a little bit. Um, Which I, it's, it seems a little sneaky, but yet it's a free product anyway. Right. So the fact, it makes sense to me if you're going to use it in an extended kind of manner like that. that right. It seems fine to pay a little bit. Right. For our last plastique, we didn't spend a lot of money, but it did you reach raise awareness. People. You do reach a lot of people. We didn't even spend that much money. So I found that too. It's, it's worth it. It's probably worth it. So that so I think that model's coming back in terms of paid advertising. Mm -hmm. um, except that it has to, but the costs are being borne by the DJ and the promoter. The mm -hmm. thing that's also changed is that a lot of these, a lot of the venues have sort of dropped their their sort of part of the responsibility completely on the DJs and on the promoters, mm -hmm. so that. It becomes much. We have to do a lot more support for the night than the in, than the venue ever has to do. Right. It it's true. It's be, well, and it's because the night is is more you than it is the. It's at the venue, but it's you're kind of the face of that night. Right. And so, but market. So then, if we, you, I guess the thing that makes me think about it in terms of marketing and also in terms of like how well a night is doing or not doing, though, is that. Um, you stand or fall on the success of your own night based yes. on your own promotion, on your own marketing, your own advertising, and all that stuff. And the, But the venue, despite the fact that they aren't really doing anything to help, mm -hmm. they have the right to basically kick you out right. if the night's not doing well. Right. So, like, they don't... I just... I guess my... I, when I, when I, as I'm saying it out loud, I guess the thing that's changed, which kind of annoys me, is that I feel like venues have a different relationship with the talent than they used to have that feels a little more parasitic or opportunistic or something like that. Like they just it, want you to come in, right. bring them the business, and they just... It, depend, it really depends <clears throat> on the venue. Uh, some of them are much more... It, it is up to you, but they, um, you know, they do pay you a lot more. Or the, you know, the, the rates are a lot better. Yeah. And, or it's a lot more fair. Other ones... You, you barely get anything, so it's just, it really depends on the, the venue. Right, yeah. And they're all different.